Hey guys, it's Jennifer. Welcome back to my channel. Today I am coming to you with my yearly classics wrap up. Uh, I did this last year and you guys apparently really liked it. Uh, so I thought I would do it again. I did wrap up the first six months of classics back in June. So I will link to that video in the cards if you're curious about uh, the classics that I read in the first six months of 2020. So this is everything I read in the last six months, and I say that with a preface. It's not everything I read, actually, because I have decided not to include DNFs or things I'm in the middle of, which I did include uh, in that video that I posted in June. Uh, so this is just really in the interest of time because it's late in the day. The lighting is terrible, as you might can see. For all of the classics that I DNF'd in the second half of the year, I really intend to come back to all of them. Uh, and those that I'm in the middle of, I will, of course, give you an update on my final thoughts once I have finished those books. Uh, so these are really not going to be in any particular order. Uh, I thought that since 2020 kind of wound up being the year of the romantics for me and where we left off with that video in June, I was just kind of starting to explore Percy Shelley uh, that I would talk to you a little bit about all of the romantics that I read in the second half of the year first. So I'm going to group all of those together for simplicity's sake and then we can get on to the other classics that I read in the last six months of 2020. So one of the romantic works that I read that was not poetry was Valperga by Mary Shelley and I just recently talked about this in my favorite books of 20. 2020, so I will try to keep this appropriately short since you've already heard me rave about it. Uh, but this is her third written but second published novel, and it's set in medieval Italy following a character who was actually a real-life person, Castruccio Castracani, who was the prince in Luca in the 1300s. And he is a very Byronic hero in this book. He does a lot of questionable things, but you like him anyway. This is a book that will not work for everyone. And also, I can see why, when standing against other works of Mary Shelley's, this one is never talked about. For the most part, the majority of her titles are not talked about, unless they're Frankenstein, Matilda, or The Last Man. This one, I fully recognize why it's fallen into obscurity, because I believe it was probably a pretty hard sell, even at the time of its publication. This is a book that's really trying to tackle medieval politics in Tuscany, which is probably a pretty niche thing, and only a certain few readers are really going to be interested in that. I was one of them. I really, really loved this. And I loved everything that she was saying with this book. I loved everything she was playing with. I really liked the ideas here. And I would say that's probably the trend for nearly all of the romantic poets and romantic writers that I explored uh, this year is that I actually really enjoy the ideas, the concepts behind their writing. The themes that they talk about are apparently themes and ideas that really speak to me personally. Uh, and so that's why I've really taken to the romantics. And I think I recognized the themes that she was playing with here. And I really, really liked them from a historical aspect. And I also really liked them from the kind of romantic aspect. And I also know where Mary Shelley was in her life when she wrote this book. And I've had to have a long discussion with myself about this, particularly with the romantic poets and the other romantic writers, but specifically with Mary Shelley, is that I am now so close to Mary Shelley as a figure. I know so much about Mary Shelley personally that I no longer believe I can truly be objective about her work. And by that, I mean, I think that I kind of read her life into her writing now in a way that I probably wouldn't have had I not explored her to the extent that I did in nonfiction this year. And so I just am really probably more forgiving with her writing than I should be. And I definitely feel like I'm that way, not only with her, but with Percy Shelley, with Lord Byron. I feel like I'm giving them a lot of leeway where I normally would not because I know so much about them personally now. So this is one I struggle to recommend. I think a very specific reader would really, really enjoy this. And this is actually a really wonderful edition of the text because there are appendices uh, pulling from texts that she referenced when she was writing this. There are some notes towards the back. There are footnotes 
on certain pages. Uh, this edition is by Broadview Press, and I do highly recommend it if you decide you want to take the plunge with Valperga. Uh, but I recognize this is a very uh, niche book, and I think it will work for a certain group of people and very rarely for anyone else. I'm glad to say I was one of those certain people. I just feel like Mary Shelley and I are really always on the same wavelength. So this is one I really, really enjoyed. It was a five-star read, and it made my top of 2020. The other work of romantic fiction that I read that was not poetry uh, was The Vampire by Dr. John Polidori. And this was a short story that was composed on the same night that Mary Shelley uh, created Frankenstein. Uh, and so Dr. John Polidori was Lord Byron's personal physician. Uh, and so he... Lord Byron, Mary Shelley, Percy Shelley, Mary Shelley's stepsister Claire were all in the same house in Switzerland. And Lord Byron said, tell me a ghost story. Apparently Mary Shelley and Dr. Polidori were the only two who took it seriously or who came up with an idea that was good enough to run with. And I struggled with this because it was so very short. It's often sold as a novella. It is not a novella. It is a short story. It's barely 20 pages long uh, and there's not a whole lot in it. It's very much just a rapid telling of events and I would say it's almost a little bit more like a folk tale or a fairy tale. Uh, than it is even a short story because quite a bit happens. He wants a lot to happen in this narrative, but he doesn't give it any room to breathe. I truly think if he had let this be a novel, if he had really gone with it for at least 250 pages, I just think this could have been spectacular. This is always discussed alongside Dracula because it was one of the first uh, fictional tales of a vampire. This was also the first exploration of a vampire in a way that we would recognize today, kind of the aristocratic vampire, somebody who's very handsome, very suave, uh, and moves in kind of the upper classes. And I really, really liked what I saw here. I just wish there was more of it. Uh, Dr. Polidori had a very fraught relationship with Lord Byron, his patient, and you can see that in this work because the vampire is very clearly based on Lord Byron. I love that, and I think, again, this is a point where I can't really be objective. I know quite a bit about Dr. Polidori as a person now. I've dipped in and out of his diary quite a few times this year. Uh, I've read a whole bunch of nonfiction on the Romantic era, and he is a minor figure in that that I kind of feel sorry for. And so I know a lot of what went into the background of this. I know how this short story was built. Uh, and so I kind of appreciate it for how it came into being almost more than for what it is, if that makes sense. I also really appreciate it because I know it went on to do so much for vampire fiction, which is some of my favorite. The vampire is my favorite mythical monster. Uh, and so I have really, really enjoyed a lot of vampire fiction over the years. My favorite book of all time is Interview with the Vampire by Anne Rice. Uh, and I know that that book would never have been written without this. It honestly would not have. Dracula would not have been written without this. And so this short story has earned its place in classical literature in the canon, in my opinion. But I would recommend not going into it with very high expectations because it is so, so short. The short story can almost read a little bit campy because in the modern day, we very much know who the vampire is. We very much know what vampires are. But I imagine... If you were a first time reader of this and you didn't have any of those preconceived notions, you didn't know that's how a typical vampire acts, this would have been very scary to read. And I think you also would have wanted more from it. So I just wish this was a little bit longer. I believe I rated this three stars on Goodreads, uh, but John Polidori did have a gift with writing and I wish that he had lived longer. I wish he would have written more. Okay, let's talk about the poets that I discovered in the second half of the year. I talked quite a bit about Percy Shelley in that earlier video, uh, so I will leave him out of this, although I continued to read Percy Shelley throughout the last six months of the year, uh, but it was mostly smaller works. I read Ozymandias, which I think is probably my favorite. I did read Prometheus Unbound, which I genuinely liked, but I can't say I loved, and I'm really disappointed by that. I had very high hopes for Prometheus Unbound, but I think it was a little bit too philosophical for me. But I did get into John Keats, I, for the most part, read shorter works from John Keats. I am not very far along in his career at all. I'll show you where I am here. Uh, so it's not very far into his career, but I've liked what I've seen from him so far. I've read a little bit of his prose towards the back here, a few of his letters and his commentary on Shakespeare and John Milton, which I loved. 
I genuinely adored reading his notes on Shakespeare and Milton uh, because I found that very eye-opening and I found that to be a very good glimpse into who John Keats is as a person and what he was into. So I really, really enjoyed reading his prose and I might like his prose a little bit more than his poetry because I think I am intrigued by who John Keats is as a person. Uh, and so I think reading his letters and reading his commentary, reading notes that he took uh, on certain texts is really interesting to me because it feels very personal to him, whereas some of the poetry does not. But I have really enjoyed his poetry. When it first started out, I thought, why is everybody talking about Keats? <laughs> because the first few poems I thought, well, these are good but are they any different than anything else that I've read? Uh, and then he started changing it up. He started kind of coming into his own. I think his earlier poems, he was very much mimicking other poets, specifically Edmund Spencer, who is one of my favorite poets of all time. Uh, so I do appreciate that when he decided to mimic somebody's style, it was somebody as great as Spencer. But I really, really liked when he broke the mold and came into his own and started writing poetry in his own forms. Uh, I really am enjoying Keats and I need to read more of him. I think he will be the poet that I try to focus on the most this year because 2020 unintentionally became the year of Lord Byron. And I fully expected it to be just the year of Percy Shelley, but it became the year of Lord Byron. I've read the most from Lord Byron of all of the romantic poets. So I wanna catch up with Keats and kind of get on the same page with him that I am with Percy Shelley uh, and Lord Byron. Apparently Keats is most people's favorite of the romantic poets. Uh, and so I'm interested to see if as I move further with him, will he become my favorite or will I stay with Lord Byron? And I'm kind of thinking I will stay with Lord Byron. So maybe we should talk about him next. Whereas Percy Shelley is kind of the love of my life as a person. Lord Byron is the love of my life as a poet. I have never read poetry like this in my life. I have never connected with poetry on a personal level the way that I have uh, with Lord Byron. It has genuinely blown me away how much I have loved his work. I've read several bigger works by Lord Byron this year. I read uh, English Bards and Scotch Reviewers, The Jower, um, I read uh, his poem from the point of view of Dante, which was absolutely incredible. Uh, but my favorite right now is Child Harold's Pilgrimage. And I love Child Harold's Pilgrimage for one specific canto, though all of it is great. But the fourth canto is his Ode to Italy. And it is genuinely some of the most beautiful work you will ever read in your life. Uh, and I read it aloud. I read all of Child Harold's Pilgrimage aloud. I always try to read poetry aloud because I think that's a medium that it works well in. And I really do think poetry uh, in terms of language works very, very well aloud, and Byron specifically does. If there was a rating higher than five stars, I would give it to Child Harold's Pilgrimage. It is truly exquisite. And I've loved everything else that I've read from Lord Byron, but to me, that's the standout. I did really enjoy The Prophecy of Dante, which is his poem from the perspective of Dante, where Dante kind of looks forward into time and looks backward on time. And it's just a really, really beautiful poem. This is the work that I connected with the most this year. I genuinely am a obsessed with Child Harold's Pilgrimage. I've underlined, I've taken notes, I'm genuinely obsessed, and I have already returned to Child Harold specifically many, many times over. I've reread stanzas multiple times. It is a genuinely beautiful work. Uh, I just love Lord Byron, and I honestly don't foresee Keats overcoming him, even though people really, really love Keats. I think Byron is apparently the one for me. I also dipped into Samuel Taylor Coleridge this year, uh, and I don't like him as much as the later romantics, and unfortunately, I believe I will have this same opinion with William Wordsworth. I have not read enough of William Wordsworth to feel like I can give you an update on him yet, but I do genuinely feel like Byron's generation, Byron, Shelley, Keats, uh, those are the romantic poets who work well for me. Uh, I do think this is beautiful. Much of what I've read from Samuel Taylor Coleridge has been genuinely beautiful, uh, but I don't think it speaks to me personally the way that uh, Lord Byron's work has. So the really big work from Samuel Taylor Coleridge that I've read is Christabel, which I really, really enjoyed. Uh, that's also kind of a vampiric story. And I do have a video on uh, romantic vampires, uh, vampires in the romantic era. So I am looking forward to continuing on with Samuel Taylor Coleridge, but I genuinely don't feel like he will ever be a poet that I truly say I love. 
which is a shame because I do genuinely want to love everybody from the romantic generation, whether they're from that kind of slightly older generation or the slightly younger generation. Uh, so hopefully I will like him a whole lot more as I get further into his work. Moving on from the romantics, finally, uh, we can get into the classic novels that I read in the last six months of the year. So I was able to finish out Jane Austen this year. I had a little bit of a soft goal to be able to do that. Uh, and I'm glad to say that I actually did it. Uh, so the last that I had to read was Persuasion. I felt like I was saving the best for last. In truth, as the months have gone on, I have forgotten nearly the entire reading experience I had with this book. That's a weird thing to say because earlier in the year I had almost exactly the same experience with uh, Sense and Sensibility by Jane Austen. These were both books that I really enjoyed during the reading process. But as the months have gone on, I remember very little about them. Uh, there is a really wonderful letter in Persuasion that I have vivid memory of, but almost everything else about it, I don't have a clear memory of. I don't even really have a clear memory of reading it. So I don't know what that says about me or my relationship to Jane Austen's writing, but I do think it's probably a personal thing. And I do think it's a thing between me and Jane Austen. Uh, I think I just kind of struggle with her. This has also been a year where I've had to admit to myself that maybe she's not the classic author for me. And maybe there are other classic authors I prefer, but I keep trying to make myself into a Jane Austen person, and maybe I'm just not. Overall, in terms of ranking Jane Austen's works, this fell squarely in the middle for me. It was not the worst by any stretch of the imagination, but it sadly was not the best, and I had high hopes that it was going to be. I really thought this was gonna come in and floor me and sweep me away, and I do think it's probably technically her most proficient novel and her most beautifully written. Uh, so I did appreciate it from that aspect because I really enjoy beautiful prose. Uh, but I do think in terms of plot, things like Emma really outshine this in my opinion. I do fully intend to reread this one day and I also intend to reread Sense and Sensibility. And I kind of think on a reread, both of these titles will move up for me. After reading Persuasion for Jane Austen July, I kind of was in a bit of a reading slump, and I think I was in one partially because I finished everything of Jane Austen's. It's rare to be in that position with an author, uh, even a classic author for me, and so I think I was a little bit depressed about that. And so I needed to get out of my reading slump, and I picked up The Night of Maison Rouge by Alexandre Dumas, and I just was blown away by this. This was so much fun. I really enjoy Alexandre Dumas. The Count of Monte Cristo was my favorite book of 2019. Uh, and I have to say this book and another that I read this year really cemented my love for him as an author. I kind of thought he might be somebody who was famous for a couple of works, those couple of works being clearly the best that he has to offer. Uh, and maybe that's so because I do think The Count of Monte Cristo so far is top tier, is the top of his work. Maybe on the whole, these books of his that people aren't talking about as much aren't as good as, say, The Three Musketeers or The Count of Monte Cristo. They are still absolutely excellent, and I don't understand why we are not talking about them more. This one specifically is really odd to me because I think this book has mass appeal. Uh, this is apparently the last in his Marie Antoinette series. Unfortunately, I have yet to be able to find any other book in the Marie Antoinette series. Uh, but this was about somebody trying to break Marie Antoinette out of prison, the so-called Night of Maison Rouge. Uh, and this is when Marie Antoinette was being held in the temple and then in the conciergerie before her execution in Paris. And so you got a really great glimpse into Marie Antoinette as a person. She was a character in this, but there were a whole bunch of other really rich, wonderful, dynamic characters. Something was happening on nearly every page, at least in every chapter, that really kept you wanting to read. And I found that I was so compelled to read this that I finished it in one day, which is very rare for me with a classic. I just genuinely loved this. I will say the ending felt like the rug was pulled out from under me. Like I genuinely could not believe that this was how the book ended. I didn't see it coming. Uh, and that can be a good or a bad thing because in some ways it was shocking. So it felt like a really cool ending, but in other ways, upon reflection, I felt like did the book really set that up well? 
Uh, so you may find that the ending really takes the book down for you, but I really, really enjoyed it. And I think it's an interesting one to read on the heels of A Tale of Two Cities, which is how I read this. I had read A Tale of Two Cities the month previously when I picked this up. And so I was constantly comparing the two as both being set during the French Revolution and where A Tale of Two Cities is a really serious, you know, internal novel that's really kind of discussing good and bad, being moral. This book on the surface is very, very humorous, but it's also dealing with some deeper topics. And so the books had far more in common than I initially thought that they would. Uh, so I just really enjoyed that. This was one of my favorite classics of the year. I really, really enjoyed this and I highly recommend it if you like Alexander Dumas. Uh, I recognize he doesn't work for everybody, but boy, does he work for me. In August, I picked up uh, Journal of a Plague Year by Daniel Defoe, and this is an 18th century classic uh, that was a little bit of kind of a how to deal with the plague. This was written and published in the 1700s when an outbreak of the plague uh, was happening in Marseille, and people in England very much feared that the plague would come and affect them. And so Daniel Defoe actually lived through the Great Plague of London in the 1660s and the Great Fire of London. He was a child, but he evidently spoke to many family members who remembered what happened during that Great Plague. Uh, and so he wrote this as a little bit like, here's what they did right, here's what they did wrong. If we do have another plague outbreak, maybe we should follow these guidelines, but change these. And he told it through a very interesting narrative. And I know a lot of people picked this up in 2020, uh, trying to read a whole bunch of kind of plague or pandemic adjacent books. Uh, and I thought I was prepared for this. I thought I was in the right headspace for it. And I most certainly was not. This book genuinely haunted me. It was genuinely interesting to me to see how around 400 years on, 350 years on, uh, that we processed things in a similar way to people in the 1660s. Everything that he talks about from the 1665 plague outbreak in London has a little bit of its modern day equivalent in 2020. I enjoyed this. I actually really enjoyed Daniel Defoe's prose and I found in part he could be a little bit humorous, but some of his prose was really quite beautiful. So I'm happy I read this because now I feel comfortable moving on with him as an author, uh, but I definitely was not in the right headspace to read this when I picked it up in August. In August, I also picked up The Warden by Anthony Trollope, and this was an utter delight to me and a complete surprise. Uh, in 2019, I actually DNF'd The Warden because I was quite bored by it, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, and I picked it up on a whim in August, and I was genuinely charmed by it. This is the first in his Barchester series, and so it's quite a bit about church politics. And so you will often find people who really love the series will say, get through the warden uh, and move on to the better books in the series. So I went into this knowing that no matter what, I would continue on with the series. And I expected it to not be that great based on some of the criticisms I've heard of it over the years, but I genuinely loved it. Uh, and actually the church politics of it all are kind of what made me like this. This is about a warden who discovers that he's actually been making more money than he was entitled to over the past few years. And the person who kind of informs him of this is the guy who wants to marry his daughter. Uh, so there's quite a bit of drama in it, but it's kind of low key drama. So that the book feels very relaxing. And I just really liked that. This felt a little bit to me like watching a masterpiece classic on PBS. It just was very relaxing. It was very vividly set. I could genuinely picture Barchester. If you've had the pleasure of going into a Gothic cathedral in England or kind of being in a church town, a cathedral town in England, you probably are very familiar with Barchester and with the areas of the country that inspired Barchester. Uh, and so I found it very easy to picture because I felt like I had been to Barchester before, so I think in that way it felt like a very comforting read. This was just really delightful and very charming. This was my first Anthony Trollope. It will not be my last. I genuinely enjoyed this in a way I did not expect to, uh, so I highly recommend The Warden. In September for ShakeTube, I decided to reread the Henry VI plays. I had big dreams of rereading Richard III that month as well, but I did not get around to that. Uh, but I thoroughly enjoyed my reread of Henry VI. I really, really like 
the Henry VI cycle. And I know a lot of people do not. A lot of people have their problems with it. A lot of people don't even think Shakespeare had anything to do with Henry VI Part I. Uh, but I really, really enjoy them. Uh, for the most part, the history plays are my favorite plays of Shakespeare's, and this is no exception. I really like the Henry VI sequence, and I really like Richard III, and I think they are some of the best that Shakespeare has to offer. Specifically, Henry VI Part II is a genuinely masterful play, and I do think there's quite a bit of Shakespeare in it. He was definitely collaborating with other people when these plays were written, but I think Henry VI Part II is almost entirely Shakespeare, and it feels very Shakespearean, and so I just really, really enjoy these. They are not historically accurate in any way, shape, or form, and I love them for that. Uh, this is a really, really fun look at the time period of the Wars of the Roses. I kind of wish the real Wars of the Roses had more people performing witchcraft and uh, summoning demons asking for their fortune. This is a really great series of plays, unrealistic and historically inaccurate though they are. Uh, moving into Victober, my first read of Victober was a massive success uh, and is one of my favorite classics of the year and that's The Beetle by Richard Marsh. This is a later Victorian classic that was published around the same time as Dracula and it actually outsold Dracula for a time. And I definitely see why I've had my issues with Dracula. Y'all probably know that. But this was so much fun. This book really made me think of Wilkie Collins. I think Wilkie Collins would have loved this. Uh, and it is about a person who can transform into a large beetle or into many smaller beetles, as a matter of fact. I actually thought this book was about a mummy. In a way, I guess it is because the person who can transform into a beetle is from Egypt and is kind of an ancient figure from Egypt. I really enjoyed the conversation this book had about gender. And while there were issues with its representation, definitely there were, uh, definitely there were issues with how it represented Egyptian culture, I mean, gosh, but, but I was just pleased to see some of these things on the page for a Victorian novel uh, because the person who can transform into a beetle is sometimes discussed as having masculine qualities and is sometimes discussed as having feminine qualities. And the narrative progresses from talking about the beetle as it into talking about the beetle as them and using they, them pronouns. Blown away. I mean, genuinely, I was blown away by it. Perhaps it is not the best representation and it definitely is not. But I was just kind of excited to see this in a way discussed in a Victorian novel. I was truly blown away by that. Uh, I will definitely be reading more from Richard Marsh. This was a really wonderful read uh, that was definitely deeper than what I expected it to be. I think I read more into the text than was there in terms of its discussion of gender, uh, but I really loved the characters here. It was really exciting. I definitely wanted to know what was going to happen next. The stakes were high. This felt very much like a Universal film. I can definitely see that Universal probably pulled from this when they were creating the mummy uh, because it definitely felt like an old classic horror film. All of the characters had those kind of dynamics and they were those type of character archetypes. This was five stars and I highly recommend it. It was so much fun and it's genuinely one of my favorite classics of the year. Then I picked up No Name by Wilkie Collins which was my fourth book by him. This book revolves around the question of illegitimacy uh, and I won't tell you any more than that because I think the back of the book spoils around the first 150 pages. And so you are really wanting the first 100 pages to pick up the pace because you know something is going to happen. Uh, so stick with it if you decide to pick up No Name. Stick with it through those first 100 pages. I promise you it gets really, really good. Uh, I liked this. I did not like it as much as The Woman in White or um, The Moonstone, which were the first two books of his I read. I did like it more than The Law and the Lady, but I think this book had its issues and I'd heard that it had a lot of issues prior to picking it up. I enjoyed it for what it was, but I think it's often sold as a mystery novel and that's not really what No Name is. Uh, no Name is a little bit more maybe a thriller. There are definitely thriller aspects to it uh, because you're not necessarily figuring out what's going on, but you desperately want to know what's going to happen next. People are in imminent danger, but there's not really an element that you're trying to figure out. You're not really trying to solve a mystery. But I really appreciated that this book 
wanted to talk a lot about social issues and about how women in particular, illegitimate women, were treated in Victorian society. And so there was definitely an element of kind of social commentary going on here that I did not expect, but I really, really enjoyed. This is not my favorite of Wilkie Collins' novels, but I still really, really enjoyed it, and I rated it four stars. Also in Victober, I picked up A Study in Scarlet by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This is the first of the Sherlock Holmes series, and this was okay. I've heard from a lot of people this is not the best in the series and that you should definitely carry on, so I think I will carry on. I'm curious to see if I will like the rest of the series any more than this one, but I'm not the biggest fan of Sherlock Holmes, so I don't know how that will go. Uh, but if you do really like all of the Sherlock Holmes adaptations, you love the Sherlock movies, the Sherlock show, and you've never picked up the books, I highly encourage you to do so uh, because they are almost exactly the same. I really think the adaptations for the most part get it right. So if you have really enjoyed Sherlock and any of the adaptations, I think you will probably really enjoy the books. This one is very short and it has a very odd turn around halfway through the book that doesn't make a whole lot of sense given what came before. And it's also so short that I really did not feel like I got to know the characters to the degree that I would typically like. Uh, so I really kind of struggle with novellas in general in the novella format. This was a 2.5 three star read, um, but I do intend to carry on with the series since so many people say that it continues to get better and better. I also read Studies in the History of the Renaissance by Walter Pater during Victober, and I had my issues with this. I don't even know what to rate this book. It was so weird. The book was oddly sexual. It was oddly personal to who Walter Pater was. He was very much, you know, projecting his own issues and his own thoughts and feelings onto Renaissance artists and Renaissance artworks. Uh, but this is technically a series of essays that Walter Pater wrote on instrumental works of the Renaissance. He talks about figures and writings that he believes really kind of started or characterized the Renaissance. And I appreciate the fact that he chose a lot of lesser known stuff. Uh, he went for some lesser known artists and he went for some lesser known literature, which I think was a really interesting call to make and I really appreciated it. This was a very instrumental book in Renaissance studies for many, many years. It, I believe it is still taught uh, at the university level for Renaissance studies. And I can see why, because it's definitely not really a straightforward history of the Renaissance, but it is more kind of analyzing how thought processes have changed regarding the Renaissance as centuries have gone on. How we in the 19th century, the 20th century, the 21st century look back on the Renaissance and the changes it was making. Uh, and so he is really more interesting for his own personal views on the Renaissance than he is for kind of the history that he's writing. And so I don't necessarily think that his views and mine align. I don't think that I and Walter Pater really got on very well. Uh, I do intend to kind of return to this because there were some essays that I found really, really interesting. Uh, specifically, his essay on Leonardo da Vinci was very worthwhile in my opinion. Uh, and I do recommend that if you were into uh, the history of the Italian Renaissance specifically. But this was a weird one and I'm still not quite sure how I felt about it. Then I picked up Armadale by Wilkie Collins, and this also made my top books of 2020, uh, so I will also keep it very short. But on the heels of reading No Name, I very much wanted to read more of the same. I wanted to read more of Wilkie Collins. I had Armadale, and so I decided to just kind of dive right in, and I'm so glad I did. I really liked Armadale. I liked it more than No Name. There's a lot of intrigue and to a degree there is some mystery in Armadale, though I would say it's also not a straightforward mystery. Uh, in a similar way to No Name, it's a little bit more of a thriller in that you kind of know what's going to happen. You kind of know who's bad and who's good, and you spend a lot of the novel genuinely dreading when the other characters will figure it out and when all of this information will come out, how will people react? Uh, and I really, really enjoyed this. I think this had some of the strongest characters I've seen from Wilkie Collins since The Woman in White. Uh, and so I just really, really love this. It's a long book, but it's another one that I basically read all in one day in one sitting. I genuinely was obsessed with this. This is a real page turner. I think between the two, I would definitely recommend Armadale more 
than No Name, but I think perhaps No Name might have more mass appeal. I think more people tend to like No Name than tend to like Armitale. Uh, I really love Wilkie Collins. This was one of my favorite books of the year, and so I do highly, highly recommend this one. An easy five stars. Last but not least, the final classic that I read in 2020 was Alexander Dumas' Telling of the Nutcracker, which I recently found out is the version of the Nutcracker that Tchaikovsky set the ballet to. Uh, so I am really intrigued by this. This is not the original story of the Nutcracker, which was written, uh, I believe, by a German storyteller, but Alexander Dumas went in and changed some things. And so this is the more recognizable story uh, this is the story that eventually was turned into the ballet. I loved this. Absolutely loved this. Five stars. Uh, it was very characteristically Alexander Dumas. It had a little bit of his charm and his humor in it. And he wrote this as if he was telling this story to a group of kids at a party. Uh, that he went to a Christmas party and he fell asleep on a chair. The kids tied him to the chair and they said, tell us a story if you want to get free. And so he decided to tell them the Nutcracker. So there are often moments throughout his telling of the story where he kind of gives an aside to the children. So it was really Really exciting to see this story told by one of my favorite authors and to have never known that he had anything to do with it. I never knew that Alexander Dumas had a version of the Nutcracker and I certainly never knew that it was the version that was eventually turned into the ballet. Uh, so I really loved this and I foresee myself rereading this every Christmas. I foresee this becoming a Christmas tradition for me. So those were all of the classics that I read in the last six months of 2020. Uh, if you have read any of these, please tell me about them down below. Uh, but that's going to be all for me today. I hope you're all having a great week. Happy reading. Goodbye.